Welcome back to Sanity Football RPG, your go-to source for all things fantasy football. Brennan's for expert analysis, top strategies, and the latest insights to help you dominate your league. Let's level up your game and dive into the nitty-gritty. Without further ado, must can be action. It is episode 106 of the Fantasy Football RPG Podcast. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Evan. Evan, how are you? What's up, Mike? Just living that Nashville life, getting rained on, walking home from work, you know? Yep. I have already lost power twice tonight, which is why we're starting a little bit late. So bear with us. Things could be going well. Uncle Steve, go Steelers. Justin Fields is the GOAT. Everything is great, but... Uh, you probably noticed that very handsome man on the bottom there. We are joined by Jake Perry, also known as Avocado, also known as JWB's Golden Boy. Jake, how are you? Oh, man. You know, as I always say, just living the dream. Yeah. What is new with Miley? What do you mean? I mean, I... she's just still perfect and gorgeous. A lot of kisses. Still yep. likes to uh, just attack everybody's face with kisses. Yep. Uh, probably important to note, Miley is the name of one of Jake's uh, 17 dogs. Slight but, exaggeration, but not by much. I mean, if we did the math, it would probably jump in there somewhere. But uh, we're going to talk about some buy low strategies, some buy low options, and really just take a look at some opportunities for you to make a move in all of your fantasy leagues, whether it's redraft, dynasty, or if you play in some like weird fantasy cap leagues, ask us a question. We'll try to do our best. But first, let's get into some news and notes from the NFL Week 3. Justin Herbert, questionable with an ankle sprain. Very strange they decided to let him play against one of the best pass rushes in America. Uh, Evan, do you think he's going to play in Week 4, and do you think he should? No, I think there's no chance. With both of the tackles expected to be out, I think there's exactly 0% chance he plays this week. I completely agree. Moving on down the list, Skylar Thompson out with ribs. Is he is he officially out, Evan? Is that is that the word on the street? Uh, officially yet, no, but he's already doubtful. Okay, okay. Uh, I have never seen a player return from doubtful. Jake, how do you feel about the Dolphins' weapons with Pro Bowl quarterback Tyler Huntley stepping in? It's an upgrade. I mean, Skylar Thompson's terrible, so... Absolute you, dog water. You can go from hating that you started Tyreek and Waddle this last week to like feeling a little bit okay about it, which is yes. great. It could certainly, certainly be worse. Uh, moving on down, Austin Eckler down with a concussion. He did he look like he had juice in week three? Were, were my eyes deceiving me? He looked pretty good. It was pretty good. He he looked he looked good. He looks like I would be willing to maybe pay a 2027 third for him. So that's a step up for him. Uh, Jalen Warren, questionable with a knee. They did an MRI on it. No noteworthy results have come back yet. Najee Harris' shoulder was in a sling. He is expected to play in week four with Jalen Warren, questionable. Najee in a sling. Any love for CPAP anywhere? No. No. No, I don't know. Appreciate the unison on that. Yeah, <laughs> just, I don't know, guys. Just, no, I, I, no, I think no. Najee's going to play, and I think Najee's going for like 120. I mean, if anything, it just means more designed runs for fields, which I am 100% here for. Man, we need to see it. So far, the Justin Fields conundrum, we'll talk about it later during Bylos. Just hilarious what's been happening. You went from chaos incarnate, but winning you fantasy weeks to very responsible game manager. Not very useful for fantasy. Uh, Devonta Smith out with a concussion. Disgusting. Like not a normal football play of a hit. Uh, Jake, do you think anybody should be suspended for the Devonta Smith? Hit? I Actions. I mean, yeah. You dive at a guy who's got no helmet on on the ground. That something's coming your way. Yeah, it was one thing that they were already pushing him back and then laid him out. It's another to dive on top of him with no helmet on. Yeah, it was like you described it. It was disgusting to watch. Yeah. Like, how does this impact your Hertz starting ability here, Mike? Do you have uh, any concern now that he's without so, his top two receiving weapons? If AJ Brown is out 
and is expected to be out. Devonta Smith is out, which is expected to be out. I have a little concern. If you're telling me, like, let's throw a couple of options that could be out there. Let's say that you're really stacked in one of your dynasty leagues or you're playing in a one quarterback league. You took a second quarterback for funsies. I'm starting Jaden Daniels over him. Starting Kyler Murray over him. Starting Josh Allen over him. Patrick Mahomes? No. Yeah. That's the line for me. I would still start Jalen Hurts because of rushing ability. But for my real football perspective, it's concerning to see how he's going to be able to make it work without just, you know, the Thanos gauntlet of receivers around him. But I still think he's going to be a solid play because they're going to get him more involved in the run game, which is enough yeah. for. Yeah, I think the goal is basically just going to be run the run the shit out of the ball, get to the five yard line, and either Saquon or Hertz is going to punch it in. I, I'm really not too worried just because this team's shown an ability to adapt on the fly to these injuries, to what's happened with AJ Brown missing time, now Devonta Smith likely missing time. I think they can adapt just fine, which is not something they could have done under Brian Johnson. So I have much more faith in them than I would have last year. Yep. Uh, moving on down the list, we have Adam Thielen at 34 years old out with a hamstring injury. Uh, actually, it was interesting. I got this question on Reddit earlier, shared, shared a waiver wire article. Jonathan Mingo or Xavier Leggett, which one is going to take Adam Thielen's targets? I am very firmly in the Leggett camp because I think Jonathan Mingo is the probably worst starting wide receiver in the league. But do you guys have any love for Mingo? Mm -hmm. No. I think Deontay is just going to take all of the targets and we're going to have a 21 target week like we saw with Cup when Puka went out. Yep. Andy Dalton is about to just put Deontay Johnson in just a world of hurt because of how many targets he's going to have. Last two, a couple of sad tie downs. Trey McBride, concussion, expected to be out week four. Uh, real quick, Evan, what is the name of the backup tight end that we care about, Elijah Higgins. So there's Tip Raymond, essentially drafted to be offensive tackle three. Elijah Higgins, converted wide receiver. If McBride's out, Michael Wilson and Greg Dortch don't move you emotionally, there's a real chance he could get three catches for 29 yards and a touchdown and be the number one tight end of the week. I don't know what you're talking about. Michael Wilson moves me emotionally without McBride. Come on. That's fair. I do, I do think that Michael Wilson will inherit a target or two on top of his normal three per game. But talking for DFS plays, if you want to be different, Elijah Higgins, Michael Wilson, Greg Dortch is a, a great bit. But last tight on the list, Sam Laporta with reportedly the lowest ankle sprain the world has ever seen. It's so low, I wouldn't even worry about it. It's – don't – it's almost in the foot, if we're being honest. Uh, but he's still expected to be out for week four. Any concerns for him long term or just he's going to be on ice for a week or two and then he'll come back and be fine? I mean, what is fine? He's been pretty bad this year. Well, uh, he could be the number four target on a pretty okay offense. Uh, he'll be higher than number four. I'm not worried. <laughs> I'm Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, Jameer Gibbs. I think I haven't checked this, but he might actually be wider or the fourth target on his team right now. He might be right now, but Jamison is still not good. Ooh. So I'm not worried about it. All right. I'm, in, I'm in Jake's camp on this. So. You should go watch any clip where he has to run a route that requires any semblance of nuance. And he looks like a duckling with both of its feet tied together. Yeah, but he's so fast. <laughs> Big fast man go zoom. Oh, man. All right. Well, that does it for our news and notes. Normally, we have these fun little intros. Forgive me. I didn't have enough time to move them on over. So we're going to head into our topic of the week. So buy low candidates. There's an art and a science to it. For a buy low candidate to be really a buy low candidate in my mind, it needs to almost, it makes you feel like worried to send the offer. You need to be concerned. You're like, Am I about to buy this guy? So how can you figure out when a buy low candidate is somebody that's a diamond in the rough or somebody that's a lemon? Now you're purchasing them and they're just going to sit on your roster and score no points. Evan, you asked this question on the show sheet. I'll throw it over to you. 
Yeah. Uh, so diamond in the rough, you know, you're looking at somebody that either has some artificial dynasty value, somebody that has been very high in the ranks that has fallen a little bit because of situation, because of play, somebody that's injured a little bit, you know, they're injured. All right. You're coming back. You're breaking out the polishing cloth, breaking a little bit of goo to put on the diamond. And you're just shining it up, you know, coming mm -hmm. back and uh, ready to play again. You know, okay. perfect person. Uh, we're going to talk about that later on, uh, about some injury folks here uh, that I have on my list. Mike, I'm assuming you probably have one or two on your list as well. Okay. Uh, and then the lemons, man, guys that just aren't looking like a part of the offense. The wide receiver twos that are just getting absolutely left behind. They're not getting the target share. They're not getting the intended air yards. You know, any one of these semblance of metrics that we like to look at to be able to say they have some life. They're just not capitalizing on the life right now. Yeah. Great points. Jake, do you have any like other strategies you look at when you're trying to even execute a buy low, what are you leading with when you're trying to trade with somebody? Are you trying to include these guys as a throw in in a bigger deal? Or are you trying to outright be like, hey, slide me, I don't know, Jalen Polk for a third? Yeah, it depends on what type of buy low there are they are because there's so many different kinds. So there's the buy lows like we talked about, or you mentioned, you know, injured player, guy who's previously been good, but he's hurt. And well, in Dynasty, some guys may be more apt to hold on to those, but it depends on their roster construction as well. You also have the buy lows that are guys whose underlying metrics look really, really good. The production numbers just hadn't necessarily been there yet. Uh, so like one guy who fit that mold, um, he just broke out this past week was Amari Cooper. Ton of targets, getting deep shots downfield. The production just wasn't there. People with guys like Amari kind of perpetually always ready to get out on them. So those are the guys that I typically target the most. Um, and then you have the true buy lows who are like, I'll throw, hey, you have these seven backup running backs on your roster. Which three can I have for this fourth round pick? And you just you hoard backup running backs just because easiest path to production. Um, but when it comes to trading with them, I like to typically start by including them as a throw in because typically the response I get back will tell me everything I need to know because it'll be, oh, I don't want to include him. I feel like I'm giving him away for nothing. Okay, now I know that the buy low opportunity may not be as low as I want it to be. Mm -hmm. Or they could say, if they don't mention the issue is the other two guys in the trade, then you can just go back. Okay, well, I'm mostly interested in X player in Amari Cooper. What would you like from my team? You know, is like value wise, what are we looking at here? So the the sending a bunch of like including the guy as a trade in is typically the way I like to start by low negotiations, just because, like I said, you can if if the manager actually forms a response or sends a counter, you learn everything you need to know about whether or not the buy low opportunity is real. Yep. Maintaining good relationships with your league mates, most important thing to make a trade happen. And I love the comment about backup running backs. Evan, what do we always say? Any running back on a 53, baby. But all right, so let's get into, uh, well, we don't need to talk about solos. Let's talk about some examples of buy lows. So we're gonna put on our redraft hats first. We'll talk about some dynasty ones later. I want to throw this one in the ring because I just did a little bit of a deep dive on his usage and some of his efficiency stats. Is Mark Andrews a buy low or is he a lemon for fantasy football? I'm 100% in the camp of a, a buy low. Okay. Why? He's coming off of tightrope surgery and we've seen guys typically take a little bit longer to bounce back from that. He is, is separation you know, has been still pretty good. Everybody likes to point to that first game of the year against Kansas City, how little he was targeted, yada, yada, yada. It was, this, it was the most double coverage he had ever seen basically since getting a starting role in the NFL. Teams are, are purposely just taking him out of the game because nobody in this offense has shown an ability to truly beat somebody deep. They know Zay Flowers can catch in the intermediate and the short yardage situations. He'll get some yak, but not enough. He's not going to like catch a five yard pass and take it 80 yards for a touchdown. It's just not in his bag. And just truly nobody else, like 
they have a lot of guys who can get open, but nobody who can truly like take the top off of a defense, break somebody off. Whereas I think, you know, teams are going to, if teams continue to struggle against Baltimore, they're going to have to pivot off of just the take Andrews out of the game mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think he bounces back from there. So I'm, I'm really not worried about Andrews. And I think he's a great buy low candidate, especially because in redraft, the cost for him right now is near nothing. Yeah. I've actually got a bunch of questions asking whether they should outright drop Mark Andrews. At that point, no. I think yeah, no. Dynasty land, if you can find a manager that still thinks that Mark Andrews is a top three, four, or five tight end, offload him immediately for a tear down, maybe to an Ajoku type, maybe to uh, Evan Ingram plus something fancy layered on top. The usage is concerning to me. The amount of routes that he's running, how efficient he is being with them. Just a little fun fact. Yak versus expected Yak per next-gen stats. Guess who is lowest in the league in the difference? Mark freaking Andrews. He is turning wide open fields into an opportunity to lay down. That's supposed to be the Tyler Lockett treatment. That's not supposed to be your big, bulky, tight end that's made it happen over the years. That was through the first two weeks. Maybe he's balled out in week three. But I'm just a little concerned about what he is doing with his targets, especially considering he's not getting nearly as many these days. So if you can find somebody that still believes in him aggressively, get out while you can. But if you can get him super cheap, pick him up off of waivers, hold him, see if he turns it around after the tie rope surgery. I don't love that. So, so doing a deep dive, Mike, you said that you were just looking at that. Did you notice the percentage of inline snaps that he's getting? More. Right? Yeah. He's and blocking a lot. He's blocking a lot. And he's clearly the better blocker between him and Likely. Yep. Which keeps him on the field, yes. But it means that he's typically being used as an extra offensive lineman because the offensive line did significantly take a hit this yep. offseason. They, they did get worse as an offensive line. Let's keep that in mind. And they still have their franchise quarterback back there. They know what they're doing. They know they're running more heavy personnel on top of everything, too, because they have one of the best power running backs in the league uh, on top of all of that. And you look at his yards per route run, lowest by far his entire career. I think we're sitting yeah, right around 0.9, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah, I I do want to say, though, Isaiah likely has run a much larger percentage of his snaps from in line, uh, you know, starting in line. So yep. it's just sure something it, it, he's doing it more than he has in the past. But I also think, you know, I think you're you're very fair to mention the need for additional blockers. Um, that offensive line, you know, used to be one of the best in football. Definitely, you know, uh, has lost a step or two. Mm -hmm. But. We're, we also have to consider that like we're talking about a team that just hasn't really had to throw the ball as much as they have in, in the past. Um, they've shown a propensity to, to go to it at times when they need to. But like last week in a game that they barely won, he th Lamar threw it 15 times. This is just, you know, it, and it's gone down every week. It was 40, 41 attempts week one, 34 against Vegas, 15 this past week. So you know, we do, that is a concern. Do they throw the ball? Do they start throwing the ball as much as they did early in the year? Both of those games, the rushing attack wasn't as effective. This team is all about balance. And I think we just see the balance level back out to Mark Andrews, maybe not being buddy, what he once was, but still being a legitimate option rest of season. In the words of a famous country singer, I ain't as good as I once was. And I'm as good once as I ever was. Uh, this this is why Mark Andrews could be a great buy low. If you believe in Jake, go buy him low. I am a little worried that he ran four routes week three. Four. Out of 16 pass plays, he ran four routes. That's a red flag to me. But it wouldn't be a buy low if we were all excited about him. Let's talk about a couple of other examples are any of the Broncos running backs a buy low? No. That's Horrible. enough. Offense. Yep. Uh, 
just had to throw it out there. People have thrown around Jaleel McLaughlin. They've thrown around Javante Williams. I've even seen people, Tyler Beatty had one good run, so now all of a sudden he's a dynasty darling. Uh, I'm avoiding that offense entirely until I find a reason not to. Let's talk about Justin Fields from a redraft perspective. Dynasty, there's a whole other shebang, but from a redraft perspective, we're used to seeing him run all the time, break off these long runs. He has the lowest yards per carry of his career. He has the lowest pass attempts of his career. He has essentially the lowest usage from a fantasy perspective of his career. Is this going to continue or you is the job security something that you still don't want to buy in on Justin Fields? I'm a believer. I think it bounces back. Their season started with a very easy schedule. Kirk Cousins in his first game off of an Achilles injury. The Denver Broncos, we just talked about that offense, atrocious. The Chargers, which not the offensive powerhouse they once were. Um, but And then if you look at it going forward, because I truly think Russ just or, uh, Field just keeps the job and Russ doesn't get it back. Or if Russ gets it back, it's just for enough time that um, they don't have to pay the Bears a fourth instead of a sixth. Uh, but we got Colts, Cowboys, Raiders, whose defense has been better, Jets, who have been really good, Commanders, who have looked really good, Ravens, Browns still to play twice. Like the, There's games coming where they're going to have to put in. They're going to have to let Fields do more. And so I'd rather get in now and deal and like live with Fields as a stash, even if Russ takes it back, just because when push comes to shove and these guys have to win a football game, their best chance to do it, in my opinion, is using Justin Fields' legs. Yeah. The offense hasn't looked pretty. It's stayed on schedule. It's gotten first downs. has great time of possession. I just throw Justin Fields as a possible opportunity out there because when they do finally unleash him, fantasy points are going to be there. He might lose his job the next week. Fantasy points are going to be there for at least a week. Uh, we have a great question from the chat from George George, thank you very much for listening. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, share with a friend. Should I trade Mason and DJ Moore for Bijan Robinson in a non-PPR league? In my mind, Jordan Mason, even if CMC misses the whole year, not quite Bijan. DJ Moore, non-PPR, wide receivers don't move me emotionally as much. I would take the Bijan side and then play the waivers to try and find a different wide receiver option. What do you guys think? It's the Bijan side pretty comfortably for me. Evan? Yeah, not as comfortable. Not as comfortable but, for me. But, but still Bijan. I, I, still, I still do think I hedge the Bijan side. We know what the offense is. We know how he's going to be utilized. We know how he plays. We never really know when, if CMC is coming back this season. For many of my fantasy teams, I really hope he comes back. Yeah. Um, but... <laughs> If he doesn't, Mason has been the 100% bell cow um, in that offense. Everybody loves a Shanahan offense, so you have all of that. Caleb just hasn't looked the part um, so far to start off the season. All right. So. Cool. Let's get into a couple more maybe buy low options for redraft before we get into George's second question. George, shot you a clarifying question in the chat. But Brandon Ayuk. Debo's out. We're all excited. George Kittle's out. Ayuk's going to go off. Juwan Jennings happened. Where in the Kentucky Fried Fick did Juwan Jennings come from? Three touchdowns, 175 yards. You love to see it. Good football player. But is Brandon Ayuk a possible buy low candidate? To answer your first question, uh, Juwan Jennings came from Cowan, Tennessee. Just important fact. Ooh. Um, went did to high you know that or did in you Murfreesboro? Just quick Google. Okay, cool. Where'd he go to college? <laughs> uh, Tennessee. Wow. Tennessee, born and raised. Uh, but yeah, I'm absolutely buying low on IU. The targets have been there. The hands just haven't. If there's mm -hmm. one thing I've ever learned about wide receivers who have some drop problems, it's that they normally figure it out, yep. especially for a guy who wasn't at training camp. I'm not yep. worried. I'm... Give me all the IU rest of the season. Yep. You know, you guys know the story from there were planes coming back from World War II. And they kept trying to figure out where they needed to put armor on them. So they figured out where the ones that were flying back had bullet holes through them. Yep. Wide receivers with drops, you're looking at those bullet holes. You're like, 
oh, he keeps dropping the ball. What the heck? If he drops the ball, it means he got a target, brother. That's a good yeah. pick. Yeah. So chase the targets, chase the usage, chase the good offense. I love Brandon Ayuk as a buy low. Evan, what do you think? I don't think it's a buy very low. I think it's a you know buy in the high side of low, uh, personally, because I think people are still valuing Ayuk a little bit higher um, than his production is warranting because they know that it's the 49ers offense. They know that it's a Shanahan offense. They know that Kittle's hurt right now. They know that Debo's hurt right now. You start looking at all those metrics, they know that CMC's hurt right now. Jordan Mason isn't the same pass catcher that CMC is. Very few running backs are. So you put all of that together, somebody's got to catch the ball there. And I think that's keeping Ayuk stock a little bit higher than it would be at a true buy low for me. Yeah, the name brand keeps him afloat. See, I think, though, after the game Jennings just had and the IU, the game Ayuk had across from him, I think that made the buy low window open quite substantially more. See, I, I think it's open. I just don't think it's wide open at this point. Yeah. So. Completely fair. All right. Clarified. This is redraft, non-PPR. Would you trade Waddle for Puka Nakua? In my mind, this is standard league. Waddle's calling card is that he's really good at catching a ton of balls that are really close, and he gets 10 catches for 55 yards. Maybe he breaks one for a touchdown. Puka on the flip side. Touchdown King, Yak King, excites me. I think Puka, you have a clear start every week. Waddle with the Tua injury, you're just hoping for a long touchdown. I would rather have the Puka side and know when I can start somebody. I think it's pretty even in standard. Um, Waddle has had the games like you're talking about where he gets a ton of targets, doesn't do a whole lot with him. That was more year one. Year two, it's been kind of a little bit of a flip, more of a, I, I don't want to say a deep ball guy, but a deeper target guy, a little bit more yak. I still think Puka's ceiling is higher, and I typically prefer the higher ceiling. And with the wide receiver group that you have there, you have enough to like get you through the Puka injury time frame. I would take Puka as well, but it, you, I could see an argument either way on this one. All righty. Well, George, I hope that answers your question. I wanted to talk about one more redraft one. I'm going to open it up and see if you guys have any redraft ones, and we'll, we'll put on our dynasty caps for the second half of the show. So Mike Evans. I just talked about the name brand value, keeping guys afloat, making sure that they're not ever able to actually be a buy low. Some redraft managers, they're a little impatient. They don't have good vibes. Mike Evans lit it up in week one. Week two, pretty sad. Week three, pretty sad. One, is the buy low window open? Two, do you think that he's the candidate that you should try and chase? I think the window is open. I think the Evans name value is bigger than the IU. Like the window is more closed for Evans than it is for IU, just because we know Evans has these stretches pretty much consistently throughout his career where he has three or four down games. And then all of a sudden he'll put up like four straight games of hundred yards and a touchdown in each of them. So I think anybody who, who drafted Mike Evans kind of knows that those ebbs and flows happen with him. And as a result, they're probably going to be more apt to hold if they're going to panic on him, Sure. But I don't think, I think most Evans managers are pretty okay. Holding the bag for a minute and seeing what happens. Completely fair. Evan, do you feel any differently about Mike Evans? Who do you feel like watching these games, Mike, is the wide receiver one in Tampa Bay? Does it feel like Chris Godwin? It feels Godwin? like Chris Godwin. It, is it does Chris feel Godwin. like Chris Godwin. It, it feels like Chris Godwin consistently is the first look and the first read at this point. Yeah. yeah. Which is really interesting because I feel like it always used to be Evans, which does give me a little bit of pause on Mike Evans because he thrived on being that first read. He thrived being on the guy that if they see him one-on-one -on, -one on the outside, it's okay, let's throw the ball up and see what Mike can do. Yeah. You know what's interesting? So I just checked Fantasy Calc. Shout out to our friends at Fantasy Calc. Uh, redraft real trade data rankings. So they take trades that happen. They try and assign values based on how they're moving through all of these things. Uh, 
Chris Godwin, wide receiver, 16 in value. Mike Evans, wide receiver, 17 in value. I think that's I think that's pretty neat, if I'm being honest. Uh, I'm just going to go through some names behind Mike Evans. You tell me, would you rather have Mike Evans or this player? So Mike Evans or Cooper Cup? Cup. Evans because Cup is going to be hurt for much longer. I would. I think they have the same ceiling. Like they're both top five, top ten type players for a week. Evans is currently playing for a redraft league. I will take Evans. Uh, Mike Evans or Drake London behind him. Evans. London. Spicy. Maybe a little bit of dynasty brain there. Why Drake London over Mike Evans? Uh, I think there's higher potential in the offense. You know, I get it. The Tampa Bay Bucks will likely end up passing more throughout the rest of the season. But I also clearly see that Mike, Mike Evans is not the first read in the offense, where I clearly see that Drake London is the first read in that offense. And for Kirk, who likes to lock on, likes to be able to do that, that's my guy. Okay. I'm going to ask you one. I do okay. want to just quickly bring something up here. So I went into the fantasy points data um, data suite that they have and looked at first read target share specifically in the Tampa Bay offense. Is it Chris? Last year in 2023, Evans did lead the team at 29.8%, but his first read target share otherwise is actually higher now than it was at any point in 2022 or 2021. Huh. It's interesting because I'm not seeing that when I'm watching it, the games. It's because the targets are just much more consolidated right now. So when you look at like 2021, there's thir or 14 receivers who at one point during the season got a first read target. And then we look at 2024 and that number drops down to eight. So the targets are just much more consolidated right now. It's basically it's going to Godwin Evans, Otten or Rashad White. Like that's where everything is going. Whereas you have to remember 21, maybe 22 as well. I'm blanking on if that was a Brady year or not. Those are Brady years. He naturally spreads the ball around a lot more, but I mean, we're talking a 21.8% target share and Godwin's is at 38.2. So it is substantially higher, but Evans is pretty in line with his career norms here. All right. Very fun. Very good to know. Head on over to fantasy points data for that. I love their, Average separation score metric. Uh, I'm going to ask one more about Evans. This is somebody that's ranked in front of him, but I think it's worth a conversation. Mike Evans or Garrett Wilson in redraft? Evans. In Rodgers, I trust. Man, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> See, in Rodgers, I trust, but he even acknowledged in the press conference that like, Teams own like he, it was a it, really interesting way to call out every other receiver on the roster for being asked was just saying teams just want to take Garrett Wilson out of the game. So I got to throw it somewhere else. Yep. So he threw it to Alan Lazard, who currently leads the league in touchdowns. Hole in Raptors. We trust. Hole. All right. We have Someone's a great question from a great name, Mike. Thank you for commenting. He wants to know what we think about Keon Coleman as a buy low candidate. Listen, there was a point on Monday night's game where Keon Coleman had one snap for one touchdown. When he plays, he scores. So do we think that Keon Coleman can continue this or do we think that he is just a wide receiver tied to Josh Allen that might randomly spike a la Gabe Davis? I'm not acquiring him. That... It's exactly what I predicted would happen with this offense in the offseason, which is with no Stefan Diggs, the ball is going to get spread out a lot more. They brought in talent for some people refuse to believe that guys like Khalil Shakir, Keon yeah. uh, and others were talented, but they brought in multiple pass catchers who can fit in multiple roles. And like he's only run 62 percent of the routes. He's got a 9.6% target share. Like nobody in this offense is getting a ton of targets because there's just no need. They're putting the right guys in the right situation to succeed, which if you've ever watched Joe Brady run an offense before, it's what happens. He's very intelligent when it comes to his players' usage and putting them in the right spots. 
So I'm out on every pass catcher that isn't Khalil Shakir because he's the only one truly showing me that he can be a one in an offense right now. Fair. I don't think any of them are going to be the one, but Shakir could be a uh, one. Kind of. Uh, well, just real, real quick, catching on something yeah. you just said there, Jake, you said any pass catcher. You didn't say wide receiver. Any pass catcher. Okay. Throw the Kincaid's stuff out the window. We're, we're going to hey, evolve if you, quickly. If, we talk if you want to real quick, if you want to talk about Mike Andrews or, or Mark Andrews only running four routes on 14 opportunities or whatever it was, Kincaid only ran 13 on 28 opportunities. Yeah, that's more than double the rate of Mark Andrews. Barely. <laughs> that's still bad, brother. For We're both. talking sub 50% <laughs> for both guys. Neither there guy you. is in a great situation. You right. You right. All right. Before this gets out of hand, because I know you hate Dalton Kincaid and I love fun, Parker would like to know, start two, Devontae Smith, DK Metcalf, Zay Flowers, or Devin Singletary. Looking at this matchup list, we have Devontae Smith facing his couch, um, Devin Singletary facing the Dallas Cowboys, which used to be a good defense. I don't know what happened there. Uh, DK Metcalf, who are the C the Lions secondary? So that might be might be an avoid. And then Zay Flowers playing the Bills. In my mind, this is Flowers and Metcalf. You're just you're gonna start and hope for a Metcalf spike. But if you want the floor, swap Metcalf for Singletary. I would not recommend it though. Yeah, very few players, and we already kind of touched on this uh, with Smitty, but very. Very few players make it out of concussion protocol. Yeah. Um, concussion protocol is basically you're sitting for the following week. Uh, Singletary can very quickly get pulled out of the game script. Uh, if you see the Cowboys go down and score on the first drive and then Aubrey kicks some 85 yard field goal because he's got a ridiculous yeah. leg. Uh, yeah, very quickly you could see Singletary become just a pass catching back. And at that point, they're most likely keeping him in to be able to chip uh, or block or pick up Parsons, which would be a mistake putting him one-on-one -on, -one on Parsons, but neither here nor there. That good. All right, we got another one. Mike Evans and James Conner for Devon Achan. He has a loaded wide receiver room. He feels good about a 10-man PPR redraft. Listen, I love the idea of this deal, but James Conner gets the Washington Commanders on Sunday. You can probably sell James Conner for a lot more after Sunday than before Sunday. And I think Mike Evans has enough of a, you know, utility in his own right. I would just keep that side for now and then see how it plays out later. Anybody a chan's going to get hurt. A chan's going to get hurt. It's coming. There's just way, about? there's way too much usage. Stop, he, Mike. No, just, he, just he stop. Weighs, he weighs 106 pounds and he's playing one of the best run defenses in the league. Why? What's yeah. bad about that? Uh, I cannot yeah, wait yeah. to see Tavondre Sweat try or Tavondre Sweat try and catch Devon HN. Like Sweat's gonna like shed a block, see HN in the backfield, and just be running in circles. But let's he'll be sweating. Dead end. All right, and we'd like to thank Jake Perry for coming on the show. It's been a great time. Uh, let's take our redraft hats off, put our dynasty caps on for a second. I have a list of people that I'd like to talk about from a dynasty perspective. I know Evan's prepared one as well. Jake, if there's anybody that you want to throw out there, we can do it. Let's get to one each, and then we're going to get to Nick's question in the chat. First and foremost, we'll talk about Jalen Polk. He's got a really, really nice ass average separation score. Uh, he's leading all of the rookie wide receivers in ass. He's the wide receiver 53 on Fantasy Calc right now. You can go get him likely for a second, likely a playoff second. And if slash when Drake may finally gets to play, if slash when the Patriots don't throw for 120 yards, Jalen Polk's going to get a little bit of run. So how do you guys feel about Jalen Polk as a buy low in dynasty right now? I love the idea of it. I worry that people who have Polk now are still tied to having just drafted him and are willing to hold out on it. Um, 
that being said, if if you're in a league where somehow he didn't get drafted, got picked up off of waivers, take the shot for sure. Um, again, love the idea of it because I do really like Jalen Polk, but I just so close to draft. Like it's hard to trade for rookies in their draft year, regardless of how bad they seem, just because so much of that, you know, sunk sunk cost in in the manager's minds is still there. Completely fair. I will say Jalen Polk was flirting with a third round, like early third round pick in super flex drafts. He was the consensus 24th pick. So like very back end of the second round. There are some managers would be like, well, I drafted him late second. Now I'm getting a random second. That's a win for me. Let me move on. But I love the idea that the guy that drafted him values him the highest. What's interesting to me about some of these consensus rankings or some of these like formulated rankings that's what other people might view them as the guy that has them on their roster almost always values them a little bit more that's why they're on their roster because they had some reason that they wanted to have them around so yes wide receiver 53 prices you might have to pay a second and a third or sprinkle on a little bit on top i'm willing to pay up a tiny little bit to get Jalen Polk on my team but is it a buy low at that no. Give it another couple of weeks. And it possibly. But Evan, give us a dynasty buy low, possibly. So my dynasty buy low comparatively to 12 months and where he was being valued then, uh, 12 months ago, is Justin Herbert. And I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, so Justin Herbert right. was, he was QB5 12 months ago on most ranking services when you look at that. Right now, we're talking QB 12, QB 13, which you're going to have him miss a game, most likely because of a foot injury. So what does that do? It gives you the chance to be able to pair off of a quarterback that you have, that you have ranked lower, especially if you're a team that is sitting at 0-3 right now. Uh, If you have a quarterback, that will help a win-now team. Perfect opportunity to say, hey, Herbert's getting ready for a bye week coming up here soon. He's also missing both tackles. His wide receivers really aren't that great, and he's injured. He's got a foot injury. Let me take him off your hands and get you some points on your roster right now. Uh, I was just looking up some trades before the show uh, that have involved, one said Justin Herbert. Uh, Okay. Superflex, 12 team, start 10. Deshaun Watson in a first, late first. I'll take that in a heartbeat. Yeah. Heartbeat, easy. Pretty, pretty simple. Pretty simple there. Uh, Raheed Shahid and a early 25 first for Herbert and McConkey. Ah, no, you, yeah. Hashtag dads for lad. Dads for go. lad. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, when we're talking about some of these deals, that are going down. Uh, let's see. We got a uh, Justin Herbert and a late third for a early second and a early first. You're not getting a quarterback that is a clear franchise guy. You you may get one, but it's not clear. You're rolling the dice with a rookie quarterback in the 2025 class. I would take Herbert. So we'll say right. Slater is locked up on a contract, so he's yeah. going to be there. Joe all is going to be there. They're going to continue to build around Herbert. They know that Herbert's locked into a contract there. They have a rookie wide receiver in Ladd McConkey who is showing promise. They it's have targets showing promise. Yep. Uh, they have the corpses of running backs in their backfield that what do they do? Figure out how to make running backs work off the trash heap. Yeah. I mean, this offense is pretty good pretty happy with where it sits it's not the crazy i don't know run it 50 times a game type of offense that people were making it out to be so yeah that's my that's my that's my pitch for herbert i love him for a rebuilding team with a long view but if you are trying to win this year justin herbert is not helping you which is very sad we have two questions that i'd like to get to from the chat first from nick watts Is Justin Jefferson and Aaron Jones and Jaden Daniels and Brian Robinson too many stacks to coexist? Uh, First thought, no. 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 Uh, Second thought, it's not really a stack 
unless it's the quarterback and a pass catcher. So Justin Jefferson and Aaron Jones, like they play for the same team, but it's not really a stack. But the way that they're using each of those players in that offense, they can coexist and score points. Uh, Jaden Daniels and Brian Robinson, they can coexist and score points. So I have no issues with it, but there's not like a correlation that if Justin Jefferson does well, that also means Aaron Jones is going to do well. That's normally what the stack means. Like if Justin Herbert does well, normally means Lad McConkey has done well. So that's more my vibe. And do 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 do. You had to bench one. Who would you bench? Chris Olave, Brian Robinson, Ramondre Stevenson, or Josh Jacobs. So looking at this list, I would simply like to point out that Ramondre Stevenson plays the San Francisco 49ers and just came off of a point three points week. So he sticks out like a sore thumb to me. Bounce back week, baby. 49ers run defense hasn't been pretty good. Uh, I believe you, but I'm it, gonna hasn't, it hasn't been what it's been. That's yeah, fair. what it's been in previous years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're ninth in the league for rush yards allowed in. So they're, they're on the good end. Top 10 rush defense. I mean, Stevenson's eighth in carries. Oh, he's going to, he's going to get 20 carries for 45 yards. If he gets a touchdown, you feel happy. If he fumbles, you feel sad. Yeah, my instinct here is still to bench Ramondre, even though I love him, just because the usage is better um, with Jacobs. Like they're just if the run game's working, especially if Jordan Love isn't playing this week, we Jacobs could get forty carries. Wouldn't shock me. Which Brian Robinson is Love is supposed to play with a giant knee brace on. Love that. That means when I see it, Jacobs can get get targets again. Perfect. Still helps him. Yeah, I just think Ramondre is the most likely to be game planned out rather than anybody else just because New England doesn't exactly have a lot of threats besides Ramondre. So teams can kind of just overcommit the run and go, sure, you can throw it to Pop Douglas. Go for it. Are we just eliminating Jalen Polk and his nice ass? Well, they haven't been throwing it to him a lot yet. so But they will one day. That's what happens when Jacoby Brissett is your quarterback. Yeah, RIP. Uh, cool. Moving on down. Jake, give us a buy low candidate for Dynasty. It's going to be a hot take based on my Twitter timeline, but I'm I'm buying low on Rashad White. Ew. Told you. I, th- I think he like, just made me throw up a little bit. Little here's like, why. Do you mean Bucky Irving's backup? I mean, the better running back on the team in terms of overall ability to produce fantasy points. Um, Second worst offensive line in terms of yards before contact allowed. Mm -hmm. Rashad White is getting 99.9% of the issues there. It seems whenever Bucky is in, they can just create a gaping hole because he's sitting at 3.16 yards before contact per attempt whereas Rashad is dealing with 0.48. May I offer a possible reason why that is? Rashad White couldn't read his blocks if they were written in English on a textbook. Bucky Irving has beautiful vision. He's also, I I will admit, he's getting gimmicky touches, but it's just, it's strange to me that one back would have such a huge disparity there. While that's fair, <laughs> Rashad has been, uh, he's got a higher success rate in man versus man slash gap schemes. He's got a near identical success rate in zone schemes. So I think that does lean to the fact that Bucky's touches have just been more fluky. Yeah. When it comes to the overall volume that they receive, not to mention what Rashad offers that offense as a pass catcher, there's just, there's, and the fact that he has 100% of the team's carries inside the five-yard line. Like, if, yes. if a running back is going to score a touchdown on this team, it's going to be Rashad White. If a running back is going to be out there consistently on third downs, it's going to be Rashad White. And the market was so sour on him compared to, like, literally from the end of last season to, like, three months into the offseason. The market had already soured on him, and the market's probably so much lower now that the acquisition cost 
is nothing, whereas the upside is a top 10 fantasy running back. Yep. Uh, real quick, went into fantasy calc. I I want to disagree with you because we are a Bucky Irving podcast, but Rashad White is currently going for about a 2025 20, round two and then pick your poise in between Jalen McMillan, Juwan Jennings, or Raheem Mostert. At those prices, I'll buy me some Rashad White. Yeah, it's it's just the epitome of like the acquisition cost doesn't it's nothing. Like yeah. people still put a ton of value in second round picks. We hit on those at like a 25% rate on our best years. I'll take well, a 75% chance that I'm going to miss and turn that into 75% chance I'm wrong on Rashad White. You might hit a 25% list. The listeners of this podcast hit like 26%. So, okay. You know what? Do with that what you will. No. Love the call out for those acquisition costs. And especially you can see it float around Twitter, Reddit, whatever your social media or your fantasy intake media sources. Everyone hates Rashad White. That's why Evan and I threw up when he said his name. So yeah, it's a good buy low if it makes other people throw up. Evan, who's your next buy low for Dynasty? Oh man, my next buy low is uh, a little disgusting right now. And it's Michael Pittman. <laughs> Uh, I know, Mike. Literally, no. Uh, Name your price. I'll pay it. I believe. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, Anthony Richardson may not be able to hit a broadside of a barn. He can hit Alex Pierce. Alex Pierce. (laughs) Yeah, Alex Pierce for his one reception for like 50-some yards and a touchdown every single game just magically, magically occurs. (laughs) I believe in Shane Sykin. I believe that he is a fantastic play caller. I believe that Pittman will get more involved. Uh, you don't pay the guy to have him just kind of stand around and not produce for your offense. Uh, they still have one of the better offensive lines in football. Mm-hmm. Anthony Richardson will figure it out with throwing the football, and he will tick up to about 60% completion percentage by the end of the year. I wish that wasn't a hot take. Like it, that sounds very reasonable if you don't know who Anthony Richardson is. All right. So 12 months ago, Pittman was going wide receiver 14. That was dumb. I agree. It mm. was dumb, but that's I don't generically, think it was. that's generically where he was being valued. It should have been like 16 to 18. Now 25. he's being valued at wide receiver 37. Still too high. Still too high. Oh, get out of here, Mike. Get out. You're Wandell here. Robinson's on. number one fan. Get out of here. I'm sorry. Hear me out. He just locked into a long term contract for a team that is committed to rolling out a freakazoid quarterback that just wants to run and huck, huck it deep. And his best attributes are in the short and intermediate area, which are also what Josh Downs, who Anthony Richardson is better friends with and targets more is good at so he is fine i guess if i had Pittman, i would sell him to you for whatever you want to a point that you made previously or somebody made previously regarding devon achan it's only a matter of time before richardson gets hurt again and we get joe Joe flacco Flacco to michael Pittman, and Pittman's gonna have 22 targets a week yeah joe flacco is gonna be nasty on all of your rebuilds in the playoffs where you're not in. All right. That was a little too mean for uh Pippen. But no, okay. 38. You said 38, right? Is his current consensus ranking? Uh 37 right now. That that is too low. He is a talented wide receiver. You're putting him outside the top three wide receivers. That's a yeah, 36. no, that's that's like, silly. That's, that's bad. That's too far. That's a bad take. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, epitome of overcorrection. Yes. Yes. Should he have been wide receiver 14? No. Possibly. I'll die on this hill. Jake, we'll talk after. Uh, but anyway, listen, you want to hear about a real buy low? There's a player in a 25% target share. Top 15 in the league in targets. We're talking about number three in the league in red zone targets. We're talking 
23rd in the league in touchdowns, number 16 in receptions. And he is valued as a dynasty wide receiver 65. You want to buy that player? Yeah, probably. Wandale Robinson, baby. <laughs> I knew it was coming. Wandale, listen, listen, Malik Neighbors is the best player in that offense, clearly, handedly. That's taking a lot of pressure off of Wandale, which is going to allow Daniel Jones, if he can ever figure out how to read a field effectively, to give Wandale some easy targets. He separates, he moves well, he's recovered from his ACL tear. He's still only 23 years old, and you can currently acquire him, according to Fantasy Calc. Uh, a 2025 two is a drastic overpay. You could give a 2025 three and Elijah Moore, Theo Johnson, Ray Ray McLeod. I will gladly send any of you a third round pick and a roster clocker to go get me some Wandale Robinson. Thoughts? Yeah, I'm in. Okay. I liked. I've always liked Wandale, so it, you don't. It doesn't take much to convince me there. Um, but yeah, the way that Daniel Jones is just kind of hyper targeting neighbors and him, it, it's a no brainer that like, that's just, that's how you win fantasy leagues is you give nothing for guys who could be something. And yep. the could be something of Wandell is proving right now to, it's not spectacular. It's 11.6 points per game. Guys, let's be honest here on half of our teams. We're at least starting one guy that we're happy if they get seven. Yeah. As you're, you're in a deep dynasty league, you're starting like seven wide receivers because it's th start three wide receiver and four flex options. Let I started play. Brenton Strange in a flex spot this past week. I would have killed to just know that Wandell was going to be in it. Yeah, that would have ruled. I mean, he's I mean, sort of Strange did pretty good, but yeah. we'll take that. But 11 point, let's see, where's he at? Dude, top 37 wide receiver that's under 24 years old. That's a win. Yeah. So Evan seems furious with this. Jake, give me one more dynasty by low and then we're going to get out of here. So my dynasty by low, absolute superstar, number one on the field, number one in your hearts. You ready for this? Are you? I'm scared. Darnell Mooney. Is the moon gibbous? If it's waxing or waning, I'm in. But if it is a crescent moon, moon is out. See, I don't know. What I do know is Kirk Cousins starting to look like him old self again. Mooney's got 15 targets in the last two games. And even in redraft, Mooney's valued outside of the top 50 receivers on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. I can't, I'm not looking at fantasy calc, so I have absolutely no clue what his dynasty market is right now. I'll pull it up for you. Don't worry I about it. I appreciate you. But well, I guarantee he's outside of the top probably 65 wide receivers. He's wide receiver 63. I was so close. So I'd rather have Wandale. Go get Wandale, brother. Go get them both. Might as well for a third. Go send two thirds, freaking Jalen McMillan and $7 in fab. You can have Trey Tucker and a warm handshake. I'll, I will, in real life, buy you a Twinkie. That's Deal. like ten percent of most leagues buy-in. Anyway, yeah. I will buy you a Twinkie if you send okay. me Darnell Mooney and Wondell Robinson. Perfect. And guess what? Also, eleven point six points per game. We're basically talking about the same guy. Wide receiver two on a bad offense. Let's get him, baby. I don't think that I I I gotta take the bad yeah. offense part away from them. But they could get better. An ascending offense. Yes. It's getting better. It's but. getting better. Yeah, I mean, 100% route participation. He's getting his deep targets. Apparently, even though he's only got two on the season, but his eight out is 15.3. Make that one make sense. <laughs> they were just 60-yard targets. 32% or uh, 32nd in the league in target share, sixth in overall snap rate, 100% true catch rate. Nearly 2.0 yards per out run right now, just shy of it, sitting at 36 in the league on that. First and contested catch rate. In that offense, some dog's going to hunt. And sometimes it's going to be Darnell Mooney, and you bet your ass I'm in. Heck yeah. Send it. All right. We got one more question.
Jake, it's just you and me now. I've been dealing with some technical difficulties. It's going to be a magical moment. Andre, I hope you're listening. I hope you wrote, liked, subscribed. Send this to your mom. Tell Mama Silva that we say hi. But he wants to know what we think about JT, Burrow, and Pickens for Lamb, Anthony Richardson. It's a half PPR, 12-team league. I'm going to guess this is redraft. We'll talk about it like it's redraft. Andre, if it's Dynasty, please let us know. Uh, in my mind, Lamb, greater than Jonathan Taylor. Anthony Richardson, greater than Burrow. Even, don't worry about the passing concerns. Anthony Richardson, good for fantasy. Clarified that it is redraft. And Pickens, I love the guy to death. The breakout is coming. He's probably not reaching Lamb's level. For a redraft league like this, you don't really need elite, elite depth. So give me the Anthony Richardson and Lamb side so you have two cornerstones you can work the waivers on for the fringes of your roster. Yeah, especially with you know the sharing of the roster there. Assuming it's like a pretty standard format, two running back, two wide receiver, and a flex, you're starting you know Gibbs and Mason right now probably with Dobbins as an option weekly as well. Yeah. Um, if anything happens to James Conner, you have a nice handcuff there in Benson. And then wide receiver-wise, you get to start Lamb and DK every single week, Cup when he's healthy, but even if he's not, you can pick between Brian Thomas Jr. and Christian Kirk. You get a guy there. Pearsall, once his you know his gunshot wound fully recovers and he's able to get on a football field, should see some opportunities there. I think your team's in a better situation just because Burrow's ceiling is limited. His floor is not great. JT is great. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's a phenomenal running back, but yep. lacks a lot of the pass catching upside. And George Pickens, like Mike said, regardless of what you think of him as a talent, I'm still not super in on him as a talent. But it, it just and it also mostly just boils down to the fact like they don't have to throw the ball a ton. Their defense is so good they can just run the clock out. And if they keep doing that, you're praying that one deep ball to Pickens doesn't end up in a DPI or the one deep ball doesn't miss. And yep. I don't like to make that bet. So yeah, I'll take the the surefire volume in what I expect to be a better offense the rest of the season with the Cowboys and just the weekly upside of Richardson is unbeatable. Yep. Andre, hope this helps. Thanks for listening. Thanks for commenting. But Jake, it's been an absolute pleasure. Tell the people at home where they can find you more of your work. Yeah. So you can find all of my fantasy football content through JWB. So uh, most of that's going to be on YouTube and, you know, any podcasting platform. That's where most of my stuff is. You can follow me on Twitter at Perry underscore FF. And then moving forward, I'll be doing entertainment content, uh, potentially some golf content as well with the in between media team. Very cool. I saw that. Congratulations on the new gig, man. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. I'm excited, man. It's a great opportunity to branch out of football. And as much as I love football and all the fans over here, Eagles got to spread its wings sometimes. Yeah. I mean, are you doing anything I'm, other than those two things? Oh, yeah. Also, I was going to get there, but yeah, we were, we were talking. And in the true epitome of I'm a peacock, Jerry, you got to let me fly. You should see me attempt to fly every once in a while on nights of the appropriately shaped table, which is Mike and I's D and D podcast. It's a great time. You are currently in the middle of a zombie arc. So we're going to be playing essentially like all of duty zombies, but in D and D format. So if that interests you check out nights of the appropriately shaped table, thanks everybody. Bye. -bye.